For he is the name that is above every name. A name that has been, from the very beginning, the voice of God over the hovering of the vastness of nothing called everything into being. The name that came to redeem a people. It's the name who dwelt among us, hung on the cross, all for his glory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, as we come together to worship you, Lord. Our songs are mere words, but it's the intention of our heart, God, to sing unto you, to bless your name, the name that is above every name. Oh, Lord, we just pray now as we hear from you and your word, God, that your word, your breath would speak to each one of us, God. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would cast me aside, a sinner, that they may hear from you this morning. So, Lord, do your work, Heavenly Father, we pray, as we submit to your teaching this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. And if some if Sunday school, this would be the time to, to go to Sunday school. Praise God. And if you got your Bibles with you, or your Bible on your phone app, however you've got it, um, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 11 this morning. We are doing verse by verse through the book of Genesis, and that's how we teach in every book. Um, Genesis chapter 11. It's where we happen to be this morning, and we're going to have a fun time because we've got another <laughs> genealogy. Please pray for me. But listen, last week we ended in chapter 11, and we, we really an interesting time in the life of God's people because the descendants of Noah, we, we talked about this, and the image last week I gave you was sort of like a funnel that we could put to the side, the broad base of all these people, how the intent of the Bible is to narrow the focus to a fine point of Jesus Christ. As we can see it this way, I'd like to give you another image this morning because this is really what this text is going to bring out. From all time, from Genesis to Revelation, this whole biblical narrative is like a chain. A chain with many, many links. A chain that we would say spans time before Christ and after Christ. And it just spans all of this time. And we left with the town of Babel and how God came down to them. They were trying to make a name for themselves, building a tower up to heaven, but the scripture says God had to come down to them. You can never build high enough to God. It's amazing, isn't it? In our own ways, we try to develop our thoughts about God and as if we could build an idol of who this God is, but God is so great. God is incomprehensible, and yet he could be known. It's amazing that he dispersed these people with a different language we talked about last week. And really this was a judgment of a people because of their sinfulness. And this made indifference in the world. We see that it was the origin of, of uh, language. And he changed the language of these people. Before that they had one language. They were one people. They were unified. But now that they are all separated and they're populating the earth. And we left with them going forth, populating the earth. And here we are at a good old genealogy to talk more about this. But even here we see that this line, the line of the promise, was going to narrow. Because now we're speaking to this morning about the line of Shem. So if you would stand with me, if you're able, for the reading of God's word. God's word is holy and sacred. And it's worth standing for in every generation. I am going to read 10 to the end of the chapter. And again, I would ask, don't lose me on the names. And give me grace too. It's the beginning in verse 10, the descendants of Shem. These are the generations of Shem. When Shem was 100 years old, he fathered Apishad. Two years after the flood, then Shem lived after the after he fathered Apishad 500 years and had other sons and daughters, 
When Apershad had lived 35 years, he fathered Shelah. And Apershad lived after he fathered Shelah 403 years and had other sons and daughters. When Shelah had lived 30 years, he fathered Eber. Shelah lived after he fathered Eber 403 years and had other sons and daughters. When Eber had lived 34 years, he fathered Peleg. Eber lived after he fathered Peleg 430 years and had other sons and daughters. When Peleg had lived 30 years, he fathered Reu. And Peleg lived after he fathered Reu 209 years and he had other sons and daughters. And when Reu had lived 32 years, he fathered Surig. And Reu lived after he fathered Surig 207 years and had other sons and daughters. When Sereg had lived 30 years, he fathered Nahor. And Sereg lived after he fathered Nahor 200 years and had other sons and daughters. When Nahor had lived 29 years, he fathered Terah. And Nahor lived after he fathered Terah 109 years and had other sons and daughters. And when Terah had lived 70 years, he fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Now, these are the generations of Terah. Terah fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran fathered Lot. Haran died in the presence of his father in Terah in the land of his kindred in Ur of the Chaldeans. And Abram and Nahor took wives. Their names, Abram's wife, was Sarai. And the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. And the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Ishka. Now Sarai was barren. She had no child. Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, and his son Abram's wife. And they went forth together from the Ur of Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. These days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word this morning. You may be seated. I know what's going through your mind right now, and it was actually going through my mind when I first read this text, and I said, wow, what a, how is God going to lead this text? So you're going to go on a journey with me that I went on all week long, but the big idea is this. If there's a big idea that you want to write down, because you know, you ever go on and watch a video on YouTube? The first thing that happens is an ad comes up, and you cannot wait for that skip button to come. And you want to press that skip button so you can watch the video that you wanted. But here it is. This is often how we treat genealogies in the Bible. It's as if, like, okay, it's just not important. I don't want to read this ad. And so you hit skip, and then you go, okay, I want to go the other side. And then we go to a book like First Chronicles, and this name comes up. And we go, where did this name come from? Because we already had skipped it earlier on in the Bible. So the big idea is this. Biblical genealogies displays the faithfulness of God towards his redemptive work. Let me say this again. Biblical genealogies displays the faithfulness of God towards his redemptive work. So if you got your bulletin with you and you want to fill in a few blanks here, uh, let me give them to you this morning. Three things I'd like to bring out from this text this morning. The purpose behind the genealogy. The purpose. We're going to go three Ps this morning. The preparation. I can say of God's people leads us towards an end. The genealogy is going to lead us somewhere. And in the midst of it leading us somewhere, it's preparing us for something. Purpose, preparation. Third, the promise to be fulfilled. The promise. Purpose, preparation, and promise. So the first one we're going to look at is to get the idea of this purpose behind the genealogy. You ever ask that question, why does he put him in there? Why is this important? See, if there is no important, we're going to hit that skip button mighty quick. Especially when you have to try to pronounce them. Believe me, I read this and read this and read this and I get up here and I still make mistakes. But why is it important? Is there any importance? I would say this to us. 
especially in the Old Testament, which is so important for us. I want you to see this is the greatest need for us not to separate the Old Testament and the New Testament. Yes, we thank God for the New Testament. We thank you for the deliverance, for, the, for Yeshua dwelling among us. We're so thankful for that in this New Testament. And it's the same way the Gospels were meant, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, to give us clear evidence that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. The genealogies are here for us to develop this chart or this chain from all time for God's redemptive work. The history of Adam to Jesus Christ. And as, as difficult as it might be to get through, which it's not easy, we can learn from this. I would tell you this, to keep this in the back of your mind. 2 Timothy 3.16. It says this, that all scripture. It doesn't say, forget about the genealogies. It says, all scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for what? Teaching, correction, rebuke. So when we see the genealogies in the Bible, what I want to say to you is God wants you to know Peleg. He wants you to know Ru, which later on in scripture, by the way, it's Ruel. Ru means friend. Later on is expressed as a friend of God. This is so important that there is a purpose and there is reasons why this is here. And I know that you are just probably so excited to read this together today and go through this. But it's an intentional act of God is what I want you to know. It implies, because it is all God breathed, this implies it's purposeful and intentional to lead us to Christ. And ultimately to the full redemption of the kingdom of God. We should be reading. Don't hit the skip button. Because later on these names will come up again. So what can we glean from this genealogy? First is this. When we think about the chain now. In Genesis 11, 10 through 16. I cut it into three pieces. It says this. These are the generations of Shem. When Shem was 100 years old. He fathered Apishad. And two years after the flood. In this statement here, there's a connecting statement. They want you to see this chain. Now he's saying, you know, after the flood, he wants us to remember the flood as a key moment of God's judgment, and we should know before the flood. So if you start seeing this, one of these genealogies, although he's not mentioning Adam, and it doesn't mention Noah, the idea here is to look at this. This time in this chain we call the gospel this golden thread throughout all of time. And we can see all the multi-links of this. As when now we're talking post-flood. We see the intention of all of this. First there's a beginning. And if we had people up holding up a chain here today. That someone would be on this end. But as we know from scripture in Genesis chapter 1, there was something before there was something. And it was the Godhead. And in this, there was a plan of redemption all in the beginning within the mind of God and in with the heart of God. God all-knowing, omnipresent, hovered over the darkness. Then you can see over time in creation. There was a drop down and you got your computer and you put a drop down. You see creation. You remember the whole narrative in the Bible of creation. How God called all things into being. And he looked and he saw and he said it was good. He said it was good. But then over time we see the creation of man. That he would make man in his own image. Male and female he created and we started seeing. We were thinking about the funnel. We're starting seeing the development of the world. Creation is a drop down. Then we get to chapter 3. Tragic chapter. And we see the fall of man. We could put underneath that. You could hit your drop down. Fall. We understand what happened. The desire of the human heart. We, they saw the fruit. Then they started desiring the fruit. And then they ate the fruit. Isn't this the sin of humanity today? We want so many things. We think about it. It begins in our mind. Then we start looking at it. 
I got to tell you, anybody you know that struggles with pornography, they'd be saying in their heart right now, amen. You, you think about it. You start desiring it. And then you take. It's a struggle, right? It's humanity. God, creation, the fall. Let's go to the next one. The flood. We know that it says e continually evil was growing. Can you imagine God creating a paradise? Adam and Eve now had all been taken out by the east gate and the angel there with the sword keeping them out away from the tree of life. And, and here we see that it just kept going. Noah listened to God, preached about God, built for God, and even he fell later on. But there's the idea of a flood. There's a judgment of God, right? He, he set upon judgment. He kept two of every animal, clean and unclean. He kept one man and his wife and his family for this purpose, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So you've got the flood. If I was to give you another drop down this morning that we're going to look at this morning, it'd be this. We've got God, creation, the fall, the flood. I'd like to give you the future. There's hope in all of this. If we could drop down and see this out of this text, the purpose of all of this. And we see because in this particular generation, it helps us link the entirety of this chain. But it also, in chapter 10, we see a genealogy that when we were talking about it, it was the table of nations from Noah to Shem, Ham, and Japheth. But if you went backwards more into Genesis, Genesis chapter 5, we see the genealogy once again of Adam to Noah. This is the chain that we'll be dealing with today. And it has many links. So as we're looking at the dimensions of all of this, regarding the generations, within this chain, what holds this chain is the promises of God, the covenants of God. And it, it, it's woven together like a fine fabric. I was thinking about when Christ, I was with the guys on Tuesday and we're in the Gospel of John and we're at the crucifixion and it talks about them dividing the garments and Christ's tunic underneath his garment was one piece. It was made and, and, and they wanted to rip it apart. This is humanity. They want to rip it apart so they, they all had a piece of Christ but it was one fabric. Can I tell you that from beginning to end of the Bible what we have is one fabric. This isn't about multi-religions. This is about God and God's people and God's way of redemption. How he was going to bring them all. And it has many, many dimensions. It's awesome. It gives proper evidence what to origin and the redeemer. And I got to tell you something else about Genesis 11. It helps us understand that the Bible is true. Now, what I want to say to you all here today is some of you here today may not even believe that. I don't know where you are all at. But here it helps us understand that this Bible is true. How do we do this? Let's fast forward to the New Testament. Matthew chapter 1. He begins with what? A genealogy. Why? Because see, the, the Messiah had a pedigree. There was a way in which the Messiah was supposed to come to the world. And he wants to begin this way. Matthew's gospel is to say, I want to give you clear evidence without a shadow of a doubt if you're sitting in the jur jury that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. What does he say? In the very beginning in Matthew 1, he says this, Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, linking. All of this together. Do you see it on the chat? Like the chat would be glowing right now. With, with it just flowing through to see it comes to Christ. It brings us back to those generations. And it also leads us. So as difficult as it is, you may want to go back and read those names again on your own. And it's really a tra uh, transitional point in the text. 
Because we know where it's leading us. It's leading us to Abram. A new covenant. One to be called, Abram means exalted father. It's leading us to him. And, and you could say in, in this text, James Montgomery Boyce, he wrote this. He's a great biblical commentator. He says this, he calls this, what we read today, some of the silent years of God. I mean, there's some of these names that we're not going to hear about again. And there's people that you don't know. If I was to say something, I always say, look what's emphatic in the text, and it means something. One of the things that we see in this text, and it's an observation that you could place on the text, and I can, is simply this. They had more sons and daughters. There's names, good people, right? More sons, more daughters that are not even mentioned. And it doesn't mean that their life didn't have any value. They did. But what does it want us to say is that this world was being populated by God. Exactly what God wanted to do. The reason why God dispersed them. And even though we don't know anything about these sons and daughters, he wants to show us a line. He wants to show us these links on the chain. You know, I was thinking about how these things never escaped. We have history books in the Bible. We have books that are more poetry. And all of these things all woven together to bring us to the knowledge of God. And I was thinking about Joshua. Joshua's life, he was quite the man. And at the very end, they had committed sin against God. And, and, and before Joshua was done with his life, he brought all Israel together. And, and what they were doing is they were going to renew their covenant with God. He brought them to Yeshua. He brought them to a place that only God, and, and this is what he says to them in Joshua 24, verses 1 and 2. Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem. Who is this? The children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He brought them to Shechem and summoned the elders and the heads and the judges and the officers of Israel. And they presented themselves before God. In verse 2, and Joshua said to all the people, thus says the Lord the God of Israel. So Joshua is speaking as a prophet for God to the people of God. And he says, Thus says the Lord God, the God of Israel, Long ago your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates. Terah, the father of Abraham and of Nahor, and they served other gods. Isn't it interesting? Joshua is saying to them, even in these early days, that their hearts was set on pagan gods. And how has that happened? But you know why? Because they determined they needed the rain. They had to have been a god of rain. Or they needed the sun. Maybe they needed a god of the sun. Maybe they needed this mythological god that would be ruler over a universe. Whatever it is, Joshua is telling them that Abram grew up in a time in Naor when their people had already set their hearts away from God. They were worshiping other gods. So what we have here today is when we're looking at this, we're looking at a time of great spiritual decline. And I think this is for us to understand. It's sort of like a dark age of sort. And what was fading away is the true knowledge of God. It began at Babel and it continued in the time of Abram. Genesis 11, 11 through 17 we see that it didn't end with Apashad. It didn't end with Sheila. It didn't end with Eber. And I remember telling you before, this is the very root word where we get the word Hebrew from, Eber. It did not end there. And it didn't end with Peleg. There was a purpose of God behind all of this. And I want to say this, and I'll continue to say this through the message, is because our God is faithful. Our God is faithful. And you might need to run, write that down in your Bible. And I'll tell you how important it is. When times get tough, when your job might be going awry, when the economy is going nuts, when the country is so divided, our God is faithful. Our God is faithful. 
And I think that's important for us to know. Because our God is on the throne. And no matter what circumstances of life comes your way, understand this, our God is faithful. It's a great truth of the Bible. It helps us deal with life. And here's the other truth, that over all time, God preserved a remnant of faithful men and women throughout all generations, many lengths, to look at it, to, that he raised them up throughout the entirety of the Bible like an invisible congregation of saints for particular times, for particular purposes, that they held tight the scrolls of truth in the one truth of God. God continues. And we're seeing this, and we'll see this throughout as we look at a genealogy. So there's a purpose behind the genealogy. Second, let's look at this preparation. Where does it lead us? And we know that this is leading us to Abraham. And how does this prepare us? How would you think a genealogy literally prepares us? You know what I was thinking? When I knew Ben and Shannon were going to have Declan dedicated here today, I, I just thought of this. Like, how does it prepare? Raising another generation is the work of the church. It's the work of the family. And, and I just saw, like, it just made me grin knowing that they'd be up here with me this morning. It prepares us. It moves us. Right? Life changes. Our kids get older. They get jobs. They don't need us anymore. But that's not really true. Right? But it helps us. It prepares us because in the life of this lineage and this genealogy that I read today, there were subjective experiences. They went through some difficult times. The scripture is clear, although in all regards they experienced all these events and more were to come, they only had hope, a hope that would be based upon truth, objective truth. And it only could be founded in the faithfulness of God. If you're putting your faithfulness in our government, you're in trouble. If you're putting your faithfulness, if you're putting all your faith in man, you're in trouble. If you put your faith in me, you're in trouble. God is the only one faithful. Truly, truly faithful. So... In this faithfulness, we as Christians should be forward-thinking people attached to this chain with many links so we know our origin, we know where we came from, we know who we belong to, but we're forward-thinking. And this is when we're studying Wednesday night, First Peter, about God's remnant. We're a different people set apart for his purposes and for the glory of God. See, nothing's changed in the redemptive plans of God. Yet experiences over years and time may change and events may differ. See, this genealogy is leading us somewhere. And at the same time, it gives us a season of preparation. You see that the years in here, what's interesting and just a little observation, go back to the earlier uh, genealogies. The lifespan of humanity after the judgment of God is being reduced. It's, it's narrowing from the, the descendants of Shem. Verses 18 through 26. We begin here with Peleg. And if we remind you, in the, the last genealogy we read, it said of him in genealogy chapter 10, verse 25, in his days the earth was divided. Peleg was there when God set out the, the, those at ba Babel, and, and they left. They were a divided people. He was there. He says, in his days, the people were divided. And you can see this, the division by the hand of God, dispersing them over the face of the whole earth. They're having more people, children, sons and daughters, and the earth was being populated. They, they were divided. They weren't unified. And a people indifferent by language and gods and cultures would arise from all of this. What's interesting, Genesis tells us all. What we read today in Genesis 
fills the rest of the book of Genesis. And I can tell you the rest of the book of the Bible. It's so important for us to see this. And you might say, okay, there's difference. Why is this important? Well, it relies on, the, on biblical truth and theology. And it's the remnant will be attracted to the living God. But the world will be divided and rebellious to the living God. Can I say that again? Those that love God, the remnant, the true remnant of God, will be attracted to the living God, but the world will be divided and rebellious to the living God. This is the common theme in the New Testament as well. Romans 21 through 23. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. They were just following rules. God sent his only begotten son to dwell with us, manifested. He came from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all, for all who believe. See, there is no distinction. It says we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So it was a people that needed a redeemer, needed a savior, needed Christ. This is the glimpse of Advent, a time of waiting and preparing for the promises of God to be revealed. The world was divided. You know what, beloved, these truths exist today. These very truths that we're reading in Genesis 11 exist today. So interesting. Different names, different events, different times, but they exist. So the question remains, how does it prepare us? What is this time for you? I just want to say this because right now, pretty soon after Thanksgiving, we're going to be in a season for the church called Advent, and it is a time of coming, anticipation of Christ, the birth of our Savior. But can I tell you, we live in Advent now. We're in the same time waiting with anticipation for the return of Christ. So what could it be? What could we see within this chain and time of history that would say to us that this leads us somewhere? This leads us to truth. This leads us to the Bible where it says our Lord is coming back and we should be preparing. Taking the word of God and putting it in your heart. Taking and, and allowing God to be put you like clay on his wheel and allow his hands to shape you and to mold you. How does it prepare us? See, we know it did not end with Rue. His name means friend, as I said. You want to know something? His name comes up. Ruel. Genesis chapter 36, verse 4, verse 10, verse 13, 1 Chronicles chapter 1. But it didn't end there. And it didn't end with Surig or Nahor or even Terah. This chain just keeps going. And what's critical to understand here is we read forward thinking to the Christ and we read in the New Testament back, it all leads us to the same place. The seed, the Christ, and the cross. So in these seasons of silence, as James Montgomery Boyce put it, while one waits, are you making preparation for the return of Christ. Christ's work is not done yet. Christ is working now. It says it sits, he ascended into heaven. Seated at the right hand of the Father. He's ever making intercession. He's interceding in the Godhead for his children. He's working. And one day when it says when the, when the earth is made a footstool. To his feet, the Father is going to send him again. And we're in a time of waiting, a time of preparation for our Lord. Even when the world is divided against God, it doesn't undermine God. See, there's purposes behind all of this, that his faithfulness, his glory would be made known. 
Oh, there'll be a day. I was thinking of 9-11. And out of this tragedy, and we would say it's a great tragedy, probably for the first time, and at least in my life, and maybe, maybe you've seen it before, but it was the first time in my life where everybody set aside who the heck that they thought they were. Politicians stood on steps together and sang Amazing Grace. Then we realized that we're a great nation, but we're not greater than God. And, and even in these times where there's things that can happen in our life that could shake us to the core, and who are we going to rely on? We're going to rely on God. Why were politicians singing about amazing grace? I don't know about you. I've never seen that in the time in history of my life. At least that I can remember. But who would get glory? It would be God. They were singing about him. And the church, us, together as a people, we've been called for this purpose. We've been set apart, sanctified, the Bible calls it, set apart for an ever-changing preparation for the glory kingdom of God. A nation that the Bible says is this, every tribe, every tongue, every nation will be present around the throne. Oh, you know what? It doesn't matter if you rake leaves for a living. It doesn't matter if you sit in the highest corner office. Every tribe, every tongue, every nation, those that have an affection for him will be there. Oh, Revelation tells us, clothed in white, things that we don't even deserve to wear, waving palm branches, singing worthy. This is why I love singing together here in church. It's only a picture of what's yet to come. And here we have sight of God's great purposes and his grace, which provided this season to prepare. Genesis eleven twenty six. 26, when Terah had lived 70 years, he fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And here it is, the funnel's getting narrow. And before we move on, I just think it's something that we should see. Noah lived 950 years. But Terah only lived 148 years. Do you see everything narrowing now? Everybody thinks today everything's going so crazy, the world's coming to an end. Only God knows these things. But what I want to say out of this is simply this, and it's an observation that I'd like you to look upon the text and come to your own conclusions here. It's simply this. Whatever God is going to do, whatever God has done, it's been global. Great evidence to it. When Adam fell, resulting, it was global sin for all humanity. Global. Kicked out of paradise. When Noah's ark and the flood came, global destruction. Global. Nimrod building his tower in Babel, it was global division. Global kingdoms. Global wars. It fills the text of the Bible. And we know over all these biblical accounts is when God displays his judgments in the world and will have a global evidence of all of it. Time is narrowing with age, but our God is faithful and he's leading us in preparation of the coming king. I think this is the heart of our Advent series. We've titled our Advent series, which we're starting on December 1st, Waiting. And here's the thesis statement. Remembering the first advent of the birth of our Lord, how does that prepare us for the second? That's the thesis statement. That's the overall statement for us. How does celebrating Advent as a church, the birth of Christ, prepare us for the second Adam? That's just a little teaser for you. But here, we want to look at now the promise to be fulfilled He's leading us to the de generations of terror. And more importantly, the sum of all this and the rest of Genesis. The story narrows now to these two brothers. We know of what we read this morning, Haran dies. Now there's two. There's Abram and Nahor. And in this account, it's really interesting. They begin where? Ur 
of uh, the Chaldeans. They begin in Babylon. We talked about that last week. And how, well, in our day, if you were to look up a map, Abram and Nahor with Terah and his, their wives began in Iraq, modern-day Iraq. So the lines expand, Abram and Nahor, they marry Sarai, and Nahor marries Milcah, the daughter of Haran. And, but we're still waiting for something. Don't forget Genesis 3.15. The promise of God says there would be a seed of a woman that would crush the serpent's head and he would have his heels bruised. We're still waiting for this. And it's interesting in this text, they tell us there's a problem. The problem is, Sarai is barren. She can't have kids. Can't be Abram, right? Now, we know differently. But in first look, we would say, it's got to be Nahor through Milcah. And it, what I have to tell you, though, it launches one of the greatest stories ever written. That we see the sovereign work of God. Would it be, we see the sin of man trying to take control of their own lives. At the time, Sarah would, gave a maidservant over Abram, Abraham. And, and the maidservant, Hagar, would have a child and Ishmael. And Ishmael, is it him? There'd be many Islamic countries in the world that would say yes. But it's no. God will only do what God wants to accomplish. And his word is true and his action is always faithfulness. A covenant and a promise will be made to Abraham. Ishmael would not be the one. It would be from Sarah. And then he makes a covenant and remember in this covenant, we haven't got there yet, but I know that many have studied this upstairs. And in the covenant of this, they would walk past, they would walk through the offering to God in this case, God goes, no, I'm going to go through. There's a torch and a flaming pot. There'd be a son named from this promise, and his name would be Isaac, one who laughs. There'd be later an altar and a substitution of a ram. Later, there'd be a barren wife, another barren wife named Rachel, who would give two sons by the power of God, Jacob and Esau. And the scope of the line even narrows more to Jacob. Jacob will lead a people to Joseph and his brothers. Sin will lead them to Egypt. Bondage will result from sin. God would raise up a mediator from the house of Pharaoh. Can you write a story like this? Like, wow, isn't this interesting? This is the Bible. This is amazing. His name would be named Moses. Moses from the house of Israel. Moses would lead, Josh, lead to Joshua, would lead to the Jordan, and would lead to a land. This is what fills the pages of the Bible. Can you see it on this chain? When I'm, when I'm saying all these things, is like I want you to see all these links. They're already there in the ordained work of God. The faithfulness of God and the sovereignty of God. Look what Joshua says once again. After making that proclamation as a prophet to the nation Israel, I want you to see what he says. He speaks of the sovereignty of God. Remember, he's speaking for God as a prophet to Israel. He says this, Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river. This is verse 3. And led him through all the land of Canaan and made his offspring many. I gave him Isaac. And then verse 4 it says, And to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. And then it goes on to say, I gave Esau the hill country of Seir to possess. But Jacob and his children went down to Egypt. Remember the famine. And he goes, I sent Moses and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt with what I did in the midst of it. And afterward, I brought you out. I think this is amazing when you see this taking place what I would say for you to write is this the pronouns I gave 
I gave to, to Isaac, I gave Jacob. I took your father Abraham. All these things are a work of God. They're not random things from other people causing things to happen. What God was saying to the people of Israel, making a covenant back with him, says, listen, look back at these links in the chain. I did it. I did it. I did it. Do you see? He's got the pointer. And, and God wanted his people to know that they, his God, their God wasn't far from them. That God can do amazing things. God's sovereignty, his power, his grace towards all the people whose nature was to rebel. And even in the midst of their sinful choices, it never undermined God. Later in history, we'll see with the unfaithfulness to God, there'd be a, scat the, a scattering once again by the Assyrians. There'd be an exile to Babylonia. Not much changes. But when you see Genesis 11, finally ended in 31 and 32, it says that he took Abraham and son and Lot, the son of Haber Haran, his grandson, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, daughter and his son Abram's wife, and they went forth together from the Ur of Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan when they came to Haran and they settled there. The days, obviously, 205 years, Terah died in Haran. We see that there was a promise given that God would do a work. And, and as they settled, it would be from the very place that they settled that God would call Abram out of his tent Say it's time to go. He left everything behind. This is what we're learning from this. That sometimes God makes big requests. For the sake of God's glory, sometimes when things seem very comfortable to you, God might be moving you. And, and, and back in that day, their farming and their survival, they, they worked it, they, they labored in this. And imagine God telling them, no, you got to go. Wait a minute, here there's plenty of food for the animals. Oh, we got some water, we got some brooks, we've got things that sustain us. No, what God is saying, it's time for you to learn something, church. God is the only one who sustains. In fact, David says he'll bring you by streams of water. He will restore your soul. He told him to go. And that's where we're going to pick up next week. So what did we get from this? And I didn't want to be so abstract with this. But I wanted you to see this chain. This chain is eternal in the counsel of God. And it is those that have an affection for him that see this and draw themselves to God. So I prayed for you all week. I pray for myself to learn to be a forward-thinking Christian, seeing the purposes of the past, seeing the chain, yet thinking forward. You know, 2 Corinthians 5.17 helps us. It says at some point, by the work of the power of the Holy Spirit, he makes you a new creation. Somewhere along the line, believe it or not, all of you are in this chain. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, it says it makes you a new creation. Wait a minute, isn't this something that happened way over here? But it makes you this new creation. And we can walk in that. We can live it out now. We can prepare. We can thrust forward with the purposes of our lives to bring glory to God. And not only forward thinking, horizontally living. Preparing ourselves, growing in faith by the word of God and his promises, by walking in his word. You know, I said this before a few weeks back. I don't really pay attention. At least I don't take to heart all the studies of churches and stuff that's out there. But one is very striking, and I believe it's true. If you were to ask, why do people go to church? You would get quite an array of answers. Some would say, yeah, I'm a young family. I go to church. You know where I go to church? I go to church where they have a good youth group. Oh, 
I go to a church where they got this rocking band. This is where I go to church for. I don't pay attention to these realities because it's this. Why do you go to church? We only go to church for one reason. We come here today, I can listen to Christian music on the radio, so can't you. I could go and Google any youth group around and I could find a youth group for my children or my grandchildren. Why do we go to church? We come here today to worship him. It's the only reason why we come. Because he is God. And there is no other. It's a day set aside for us. That we come together. Unified in faith. Horizontally living this out. Each day growing in faith by the word. And the promises of God. Oh, to share an uncommon glory of sacraments. Oh, there's so much for us. Despite the circumstances you might have left this week, experienced this week, our gospel has power to save. We should be inviting the unbeliever to church because the gospel can pierce the heart of man and it breeds for us hope. There's hope. Finally, it's this, is standing on the promises of God. I know it's a hymn, which I love. But I I say this to you. We could stand them intellectually, know them in our mind. But what I'm mentioning here is, for us, for links on the chain, can we truly know the promises of God, mind, heart, realities, and in our soul? This is so important. This genealogy that we had before us this morning has a very unlikely ending here because we're saying to ourselves, well, Genesis 3.15 has not occurred yet. So where does it end? Where does this seed come? And it's this constant view when we're reading the scriptures, stop thinking, is it him or is it not him? We get this bleak picture knowing that, oh, well, it's not going to be these because they're barren. And yet our God, can I say I told you before, but God. But God. God takes what mere man cannot do, and he does a glorious work. And this is what we'll look at as we go forward and learn the story of Abram and Sarai, that there is a promise of God. There is a seed that's to come, and it's not Ishmael. It's Christ, the only begotten Son of God. The picture of Isaac on an altar wasn't Isaac. There's one greater to come to the altar of God, made of wood, and it's a cross. It is that one that will go to the grave. He'll be the scapegoat of Israel that they cast off into the wilderness. Take the sin and let it run. He is the one that will remove sin He carries it to the grave. He's the scapegoat. He's the lamb. He's the one who will be pierced for our transgressions. Blood and water flowed at the cross that we might be cleansed from all unrighteousness. This is the picture. This is the genealogy. This is why they put it in the Bible, that you would have faith and hope that our Savior is coming. Our Savior is coming. Hallelujah. Our Savior is coming. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God. Oh, Lord, we pray as we read this genealogy and see, Lord God, that there is a time to come and a time to go. There are seasons of great refreshment and there are seasons of turmoil. But in all these things, you are God. Heavenly Father, teach us through your scriptures, Lord. Give us strength when we're weak. Give us an anchor in those tumultuous storms of life, God, that we could anchor ourselves to founding ourselves in the foundation of God. Heavenly Father, help us learn and understand. There's so much for us to learn in the Bible about you, God, that you're an everlasting God, one of steadfast love. Heavenly Father, we just want to pray and just ask that you'd do a work in each one of us, Lord. Heavenly Father, shape us and mold us. Like you said in the the mandate in Genesis 1.26, in the image of your Son. So, Heavenly Father, we just pray right now. If there's someone here that struggles with their faith, struggles with these things, 
even to believe in a God, Heavenly Father, that they would see this chain today, that they would examine this chain today. And from that, the result is simply this, that God, through your word, that they would come to mind and say, oh, how I need a Savior. I don't want to be lost like the flood. I don't want to be a sheep outside the sheep gate. I want to be one of yours. It says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, meaning Master, Savior, if that's your heart today, cry out to him. He is the one who saves. He is the one who's rich. He is the one who gives mercy and grace. Heavenly Father, and I pray for those who are believers here today that they might be strengthened by this genealogy to know it doesn't end here. Oh, Lord God, we thank you for that. So we praise you in Jesus' name, amen.